Your rights are my responsibility. A man has to decide that he's going to do something. And I'm not listening to your stupid classes. Hello everyone, my name is Bill Roach and this is another episode of Timeless Dialogues and today we're going to look at the issue of whether or not you can actually know what the Bible says. Can you actually read your Bible, pick up the text of scripture, interpret it and say, thus saith the Lord? Or are we left with this whole issue of we can't know what the Bible means, we're lost in interpretations, or maybe even worse, if you claim to know what the Bible says, if you claim to know the meaning of any text of scripture, well, aren't you just breaking the rules of the hermeneutics of humility? Now, we know what the Bible says. The Bible gives us this answer that God has spoken and we can know what God has said. Or as Francis Schaeffer has said, he is there and he is not silent. And we can add in this sort of hermeneutical age, we can interpret it and know what it means. So what I want to do today is I want to look at this whole issue of the hermeneutics of humility. And I want to do it by sort of understanding what do we mean by the hermeneutics of humility. But then I've also gone a little bit further. Further. And I've dug into some old videos by John MacArthur, and I've kind of spliced a few of them together where he addresses this issue. So the main reason that I want to do this is we know what people say. They say, you can't know what the Bible says, or they're going to say things like to say that, you know, what the Bible means. Well, that's just an arrogant claim. That's not humble. That's prideful. That's not the mark of a humble preacher or a humble exegete. For couldn't you be wrong in your interpretation of the text? Now, I heard one person recently, and I'm just going to give a quote here, where he said two things here. He said this, evangelical interpreters approach the Bible with a hermeneutic of humility, not a hermeneutic of suspicion. Now he goes on to say, we acknowledge our finiteness, cultural situatedness, assumptions and biases can blind us to rightly reading and understanding the text. This is one important value of reading the text in community. Now, one of the things that I want you to see is, is that this particular author is trying to make a distinction between the hermeneutics of humility and the hum hermeneutics of suspicion. Now, the hermeneutics of suspicion was one of these issues that arose within 20th century sort of philosophy of hermeneutics, where people were trying to say because of our metaphysical precondition, the way we exist, or our historical condition, the place that we exist in history, or our linguistic situation, or our sort of finite ideas that we don't understand exactly, you know, all the details of something. So because of all of these issues, we're left in this quagmire of we can't actually know what the Bible says and we can't know what it means because either we're changing and there's no fixed stable point there or the text of scripture is changing and we can't read something that's constantly changing or maybe it's both of us or we can't fuse the horizons of the different historical gaps that are between us, or maybe in the act of reading the text, do you change the text? And we know all of this. We've heard all of this. But what's really interesting is that this particular person says, evangelical interpreters approach the Bible with a hermeneutic of humility, not a hermeneutic of suspension or suspicion. But notice what he goes on to say. He talks about our finitude, cultural situatedness, our assumptions, biases, etc., can blind us to rightly reading and understanding the text. So here's what's really interesting is this particular individual is saying that, you know, with this hermeneutics of humility, which we're going to look at here in just a little bit more, you know, that's not the same thing as the hermeneutics of suspicion. But yet when he went on to say that we acknowledge thus, he gave us many of the marks of the hermeneutics of suspicion. So if you want to read more on that, I would tell you to go read books by like Anthony Thistleton, where he actually lays out and in many respects buys into aspects of the hermeneutics of suspicion. Or you can go read my book titled Hermeneutics as Epistemology, where I look at this whole issue from the vantage point of how Carl Henry and other evangelicals responded to it. Now, he also goes on to say this and listen to me, he says this, readers of the biblical text should approach the text as one as those who discover the meaning in the text, not those who deposit the meaning into the text. And he says in brackets, once again, a hermeneutics of humility, 
is essential and invaluable. So we would rightly agree with him that readers of the biblical text should approach the text as those who discover the meaning in the text, not those who deposit meaning into the text, which really means you read from the Bible, you don't read into the Bible. And he ironically says that, you know, we need the hermeneutics of humility in order to overcome this because, you know, you might be getting it wrong. Now, what I want us to see here is, before we dive into a couple articles, is that this is nothing new. This is not something that surprises me. And in fact, I've said multiple times on multiple occasions that so many of the inroads of sort of CRT and cultural situated hermeneutics or contextual theology found its inroads into the evangelical world through their hermeneutics departments, through their ways of trying to interpret the biblical text. And it's because they're so focused upon all of these issues related to our metaphysical situation or our historical situation or our linguistic situation and all these other situations that we've sadly and very unfortunately moved away from the idea that God is there, God has revealed himself, God has spoken, and we can interpret what he has said. And the simple idea that the Bible means what it says and it says what it means. Now, none of this is really sort of foreign to the issues that Protestants have had to deal with. I mean, just think about it in this sense. We've had to deal with Roman Catholicism that says there's no perspicuity to the text of Scripture. You need the magisterium in order to rightly interpret the text of Scripture. You can't know what the Bible says without an infallible authority and an infallible interpreter telling you what the text of Scripture says. Now, mind you, they've never really come out with their full canon of perfect interpretations of the text of Scripture. That would also require you to have a perfect and infallible interpretation of their supposed perfect and infallible interpretation. So in that sense, it just keeps moving the whole issue of authority and interpretation one step further. Now, the other areas that we're used to seeing this is, is with an evangelicalism. We've seen the whole rise of the Bible study movement where people are going to say, well, what does that text mean to you? Well, this text means to me, and they come up with all of these sort of esoteric meanings, but nobody ever gets to the fact that the Bible means what it says, and it says what it means, and it means what the grammatical sense of the text of Scripture actually says in its propositional form during the time in which it was written. And we've seen this in other areas and probably more sort of flagrant, robust, sort of in-your-face forms coming from postmodernism, sort of Derrida and Foucault and all the rest. And they're going to say things like, you know, there are no overarching truths or there are no overarching narratives. You have your own individual truths and maybe there's no such thing as truth at all. But the point is, is that if the Bible claims to communicate truth, well, you can't no truth. That's a relativized concept. You can't actually know something that doesn't contain the deposit of truth. Or as we've talked about here, this whole issue of existential hermeneutics, which is, you know, kind of contrasted in this sense. Classical understandings of how we are would be something like this. To be is to do. So who I am determines the actions that come from me. So if I'm a human being, I'm a rational animal in this sense, made in the image of God, and I do rational things. Or if you're going to look at a dog, the nature of a dog gives way to the actions of a dog. So he's chasing the postman down the road or barking at the door, begging for food and all the rest. Now, what's interesting is, is that existential hermeneutics has flipped that on its head. Instead of to be is to do, to do is to be. And the point is, is that your actions, and those could be your metaphysical actions, because they're always having this idea that our essences aren't final and fixed, or the different historical situations. You know, you're not the same person you were five years ago. You you live in a different historical horizon now, or the linguistic situations that, you know, you can't have an objective meaning put into the text of scripture. It's, you know, it's power plays and it's power dynamics controlled by your culture and your context. We've seen all of this. We're familiar with all of this. And so many evangelicals push back against this, but yet we're 
bring it. We're really bringing it right back into the church again today. So let me give you a couple examples. The whole issue of contextual theologies where people are going to say, you know, there's no one particular theology of the Bible, but there are multiple theologies. So you can have your African theology or your Asian theology or your feminist theology or your gay theology or your black theology and all the rest. In fact, this is what gave rise to the whole issue of woke hermeneutics, where all of these particular contextual situations and the issues of Thistleton and Heidegger and Gadamer and all of the, the Dasein and all of the, the issues of conventionalism were manifestly brought forward into a culture that tried to say not only was the hermeneutics of suspicion true and these contextual hermeneutics and these existential hermeneutics, but by the very reading of a text, somebody, because of their racial perspective or their gender perspective, might have a deeper understanding of that text. And if you differ with them, well, that's just maybe your racism that's coming out or you're trying to hold you know, your white fragility out because you can't lose the dominant power that's being expressed. And, you know, the reason for this is, is that, you know, many people have talked about, well, what is woke? Woke is a neo-Marxist conspiracy theory that deals with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is the whole issue of, you know, critical consciousness. Inclusion doesn't really mean you're bringing everybody in and everybody gets their valuable place at the table. Rather, it means we're only going to include those who are trained and buy into critical consciousness and equity is really not just everybody gets a fair share. It's, it's well, cultural Marxism, it's communism in that regard. So when they were bringing these things to the text, this whole idea of, Oh, you have a, the diversity initiative that's brought in. You have a special critical consciousness that's brought in. Doesn't that sound like card carrying Gnosticism? Well, that's because it is. And if you want to see a great lecture on it, just go listen to what James Lindsay has had to say about the rise of just this classical idea of hermeticism and its roles throughout Western history. Or you can go and look at a lecture that I gave on Schleiermacher and his divinization of hermeneutics and see that the hermeneutical spiral and the hermeneutical circle and all of these contextual things gave rise to all of these issues that we're seeing today. The point is, is that these people are trying to say that due to all of this baggage, all of our finitude and all of our cultural situatedness and all of our assumptions and all of our biases, they're going to keep us, they're going to blind us from reading and rightly interpreting the text of scripture. That's what they mean by this whole issue of the hermeneutics of humility, which is really a hermeneutics of suspicion. Now, here's one interesting thing that we're going to look at a few articles. And again, I promised you the, the MacArthur video. Notice this. They say all of those things about the text, but no, each of these people limit and apply these things to everything except their own texts. They tried to put all of these limits to everything except the books that they write and the lectures that they give or the letters that they're going to put out or the tweets that they put out on the internet. Because if they're correct, that would have to apply to everything, which means you can't understand them when they say that all of your finitude and your cultural situatedness and your hermeneutics of humility and all the rest keep you from having an objective, certain interpretation of the text. But they don't do that. Have you ever noticed this? Have you ever noticed that for them, as I say all the time, that what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander? Well, the sauce for the goose in this sense is not sauce for the gander because while they say you can't do all of these things in all of these other areas, they expect you to do it with their very text themselves. And you go, well, that seems like just a massive contradiction and very inconsistent. And I go, yes, you're right. It is very very inconsistent, and it would be very contradictory because in one arena, this person goes out and gives these manifest lectures about how we have to live by the hermeneutics of humility. In another area, they talk about all of the books that they're publishing and why you need to read them because they're going to help you understand what the Bible says. And then in another area, they're going to say that we need to be preachers of the word for faith comes by hearing and hearing that which comes from the word of God. But 
which situation allows us to have clear communication or not. That's where the rub starts to meet the road. Now let's look here because there's a couple articles that I want us to break down here where they kind of talk about this. Now, John MacArthur, and we're going to kind of divulge into this, and he talks about this, and he talks about this whole issue of, you know, how most people act like they can't know what the Bible means. And he looks at this by talking about this whole issue of the hermeneutics of humility. And he says this, and so we often hear of a new hermeneutic, grossly mislabeled as the hermeneutics of humility, which essentially says, I'm far too humble to say that I know what the Bible means. And anybody who claims to know what it means is arrogant. He goes on to say this. He says, but what's more arrogant than claiming that God has not spoken clearly enough for us to understand? Think about this. What's the real arrogant claim here? Is it more arrogant to say that, well, I can't know what the text says, or I know what the text says, or to say that God lacks the ability to actually speak clearly? Now, one of the things that you have to see here is, is that you'll see this fleshed out. When they talk about the hermeneutics of humility, they're making that within the broad sphere of it, within the realm of epistemology, which is how we come to know things. And we need to approach it very humbly because you could be wrong. But I raise the question, is humility that which falls on the organ of the intellect or on that of the will? Is it more humble to say, I know what the text of Scripture says and I submit to it, or I don't know what the text of Scripture says, so I don't know what I need to do with it? And notice what he says. It's actually more arrogant to claim that God has not spoken clearly enough for us to understand. Now, let's look at one more article here where he talks about this. MacArthur says, and then the new says one of the professors in the master seminary gave me an article on the new hermeneutics called the hermeneutics of humility. And he fleshes out the postmodern aspects of it. And he says this, and in this postmodern tolerant environment, the hermeneutics of humility, it's actually, he says, it's actually, there are books on it. Here's how it works. Oh, who am I to ever suggest that my view of scripture is the right one? You know, I would never, I'm too humble. I would never. And he goes on to say this. Then there's the attack from the capricious, the capricious people who don't study, you know, ignorance, lack of study, lack of hermeneutics. The worst one I hate is the Bible codes. If you got any books on that and he goes on and on and on. But the point is, is that this hermeneutics of humility is really just a postmodern idea that we can't know reality in and of itself. But like I have told you, they think that you can know the reality that they communicate which they think corresponds to the way things actually exist about the world in which we exist that says you can't actually correspond about the way things exist or know the world in a way that it actually exists. And what's so interesting about this is that this is exactly what Francis Schaeffer warned us about in his whole issue of the God who is there, which talks about the breakdown of Western thought. And he responded to it by saying he is there and he is not silent. People don't just wonder today whether or not God exists. They wonder whether or not God has spoken. And the point that Schaefer said is that he is there and he is not silent. And as I've added, and we can know what he has said. And Schaefer warned about this with this whole issue of the existential methodology, which is the hermeneutics of humility. And MacArthur here in just a second warns us about the dire effects of this upon both preaching and our lives and within the church. And one of the reasons that this is so important is, is that the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy speaks to the issue of all of this hermeneutics of suspicion and the new hermeneutic from Boltmann and all the rest, contextual theologies, woke theologies, and all of these different ologies that are facing us today. In fact, when you go and read the primary literature from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy and the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, they not only discuss these issues, not only did they warn us about these issues, but they said these different ideologies are incompatible with the doctrine of inerrancy.
And what's so interesting is, is that people say, well, we need a, a well thought out book on this. And I would point you to just a few. One, I would point you to Carl F. H. Henry's God, Revelation and Authority, where he deals with this whole idea that God in his infinite wisdom has revealed his mind in propositional form in the text of scripture and you being made in the image of God are created to know God's reality, including the reality of the text of scripture. I would also tell you to go and read our book, Defending Inerrancy. We have a whole chapter on this issue, on the issue of hermeneutics. And I would even recommend Norman Geisler's volume one, his chapters of his systematic theology on philosophical hermeneutics and hermeneutics. So with all of that aside, I want to switch here very quickly to the thing that most of you clicked on here for. But now you have context, which is this whole issue of John MacArthur addressing these. So I want to really just let him speak for himself here. And you'll see how dire this situation actually is. Now, having said that, I need to back up a little bit. We got about halfway through 15 compelling reasons why we explain the meaning of the Scripture. But as I was thinking about that, I realized that maybe we need to back up before we do the, the last half of our little list and make something very clear. And it is simply this, the meaning of Scripture can be known. It occurred to me sometime early in the week that there might be some of you saying, well, are we sure that we can actually get the meaning right? There are so many interpretations of the Scripture, and you hear this all the time, all the time. I was just reading an article this week in a national Christian periodical uh, that basically uh, conveyed the idea that getting to the meaning of Scripture is, is very difficult and that reading the Bible may lead you to reject the things you've always believed. So one of the reasons that people think that it's so difficult is because of all these issues that we laid out in the first few minutes. One of the things that you've got to find and one of the things you've got to counsel people is that when they go to study hermeneutics within their seminaries or within their Bible colleges, they're usually studying a very small sect of hermeneutics, which is 20th and 21st century philosophical hermeneutics. I would really recommend that you go read books by figures like uh, Robert Thomas on evangelical hermeneutics, where he sort of charts the history of this very sort of decline into existential hermeneutics or post-Kantian subjectivity within hermeneutics. And it's just manifested itself in a variety of ways. Unfortunately, in short, people don't actually learn how to read the Bible. They learn how to engage philosophical, skeptical hermeneutics. Because all of a sudden you're going to see it in a new light and it's going to take on new meaning and uh, experiences are going to happen and intuitive elements are going to rise up and, and you may find yourself having your theology changed by reading the Bible and seeing in it something you never really knew was there. Well, that raises the question that is often raised by uh, people who are critical of any strong doctrine or any strong convictions, and they say, well, what makes you think you can know what the Bible means when there are so many people who take differing views? In fact, that has actually become a kind of hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is the uh, science of Bible interpretation. And this is called the hermeneutics of humility. And the hermeneutics of humility says, I am far too humble to tell you I know what the Bible means by what it says. And actually, the assumption is that anybody who tells you they know what the Bible means is nothing short of arrogant because we really can't know. Now let's look here real quick. What's really interesting is that these people are going to say, well, there are all of these different interpretations of the text. Everybody got, has their own interpretation. You have yours, she has hers. And, you know, how are we to decide? How can we figure out which one is correct? And you know what I usually do is I go, well, I don't really see it that way. And then they try to convince me that their position is correct and that I am wrong. But no, they give you an objective interpretation of that very claim that there are all these different interpretations of which they expect you to have a single objective 
clear cross-cultural interpretation of it. And in addition to it, if they say, well, the divergence of interpretations, there's multiple interpretations of this means you can't actually adjudicate which one's right or wrong. Well, I differ with this person and they think that everybody else can see that they're clearly right and I'm clearly wrong. But sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Let's keep going here. Now, this would certainly be the position of the Roman Catholic Church that no person or persons outside the triumphal realm of those who run the Catholic system could ever hope to understand what the Bible means. The Bible, for the run-of-the-mill folks, is unclear, says the Roman Catholic Church. It's impossible for them to interpret. Consequently, the Catholic Church did everything it could uh, for a thousand years to keep the Bible out of the hands of the people because they didn't have what it took to be able to interpret it. Uh, the Catholic Church said and still says the only interpreter of Scripture is the infallible church. Only the infallible church can interpret Scripture. So you have the unenlightened masses completely incapable of interpreting the Bible. So what you must do is keep it out of their hands. Well, that didn't work once the Reformation came. The Bible was then placed in the hands of people. The question is, can we know what it means? By the way, as just a footnote to that, symbols develop, ceremonies develop, rituals develop in direct proportion to the obscurity of understanding the Scripture. So when you look at the Roman Catholic Church and you see all of the symbols, all of the rituals, all the ceremonies, it is in direct proportion to the obscurity of the meaning of Scripture. See, this is another thing that's really interesting is, is this is not just a Catholic issue. This is something that's deeply facing Protestantism. And he's illustrating it first and foremost from within Roman Catholicism. Many of the things that you see put forward just come down to an issue of, well, you can't really know what the Bible says. Therefore, the magisterium must tell you, where does the magisterium get this? They get this from the second source of revelation, which is tradition. But interestingly enough, is we've seen how that worked out and what the Reformation did to correct it. But within Protestantism, we're suffering from this issue because so many evangelicals today are saying, well, we believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, but you just can't know what it says. And we wonder why we see the woke hermeneutics and the critical race theory and the feminist theory coming in and all these other ideologies that are just infiltrating the church. And note this, within Roman Catholicism, it expressed itself in the form of worship and in within our modern day church, it's expressing itself in all of the different forms of worship that people are giving. The point is, is that when you separate yourself either from the grounding of the word of God saying that it's totally true or what we're seeing here of this idea that you can actually know what it says and put it into practice, it leads to false appropriations of worship. Let's keep going here. In the minds of people. You don't tell them what it means, you give them symbols. Always they are in direct sort of reverse proportion. The less the understanding, the more the symbols. You expect that in the Roman Catholic system. You don't expect that in the evangelical church. I received a letter this week from a man who wrote me to thank me for my ministry and tell me he prays for me and I appreciate that. This is a man who said this, and I quote, "'Certitude when it comes to the Bible is idolatrous. I have been forced to give up certitude. If there is a foundation in Christian theology, it is not found in Scripture. Theology must be a humble human attempt to hear God and never about rational approaches to texts.'" And the man is very certain about that, and he just communicated that to you in a very rational way. Hmm end quote. Certitude is idolatrous. We can't know what the Bible means. We can't draw theology out of Scripture. I've given up certitude. Approaching the Bible is never a rational exercise. Another popular emerging church leader said, clarity is overrated. Shock and ambiguity often stimulate more thought than clarity. questions whether or not it's orthodox biblical thought. 
Because, yeah, they gave a lot of shock and all, but it was all shock and heresy. And another writer, Leslie Newbigin, says, the gospel is not a matter of certainties. This is what's floating around in people's minds and leads to the conclusion that not only can we not know what the Bible means, it really doesn't matter because it might lead us to idolatry and to arrogance and somehow we, we might not be nearly as stimulated as we would be with shock and ambiguity. One point of interest, I can't tell you how many evangelicals right now are obsessed with Les Leslie Newbigin and Karl Barth, two individuals who were at the forefront of this within the 20th century and they're writing dissertations in order to understand contextual theologies and cross-cultural theologies and all the rest. You have to be immersed in this various literature. But listen to what they just said. Can't know what the Bible says and you will be manifestly arrogant to claim that you know what it means and you know what it says because you can't have certainty and objectivity except on those very claims that they give you. You know, I don't think the New Testament is that hard to understand. I think part of the problem is we have so much bad interpretation over the last 2,000 years. The See, he's going to flesh that out. Like, yes, he's going to get into the whole issue of Paul and Peter and how Peter said that some of Paul's writings are hard to understand and he's not downplaying the work that you have to put into understanding the text of Scripture. The point is, is that when you bring all of these extra categories and baggage in, yeah, it makes the New Testament and the Old Testament very difficult. But look here at what he's going to do. He's going to show you that the New Testament presupposes that you can have an understanding of Scripture by presupposing and showing you have an understanding of the Old Testament when it uses the Old Testament. Muck up the waters of what is pretty clear. The first century Christians understood it, and they were largely Gentiles. They had no previous background in Christianity. No, that would be a cultural difference. That would be an issue of dealing with cross-cultural issues of hermeneutics. That would be a different historical situation. That would be a translational situation and an issue of going from one language to another. No, note how he's going to deal with this. And the reason I bring that up is because that's what all these people say are the biggest barriers to actually understanding the meaning of the text and why you have to have a hermeneutics of humility. They didn't come out of a Christian culture, Christian society. They had no prior understanding of Israel, no prior understanding of the Old Testament, the history of Israel, divine revelation in the Old Testament. And yet, the New Testament writers show absolutely no hesitancy in expecting the Gentile Christians to be able to read the Old Testament or a New Testament letter in their own language and get it. Think about the argument in Romans 4. Paul's writing to Romans, and they're Gentiles, and he makes this case in the fourth chapter about Abraham 2,000 years ago. The whole fourth chapter is a critical illustration of the reality of justification by faith alone as illustrated in the life of Abraham. The expectation was that they would fully understand it fully grasp it. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and we all know what the Corinthians came out of, right? In the tenth chapter of 1 Corinthians, reading it just today, and he says, do you remember the story of the Exodus? And he goes all the way back to Moses, 1,500 years before. Do you remember what happened to those people in the Exodus who decided to get a little overconfident and start to live on the edge of their liberty? You know what happened to them. They fell into idolatry. They fell into immorality. They fell into uh, grumbling and complaining. They even fell into testing God. And guess what? They died, 3,000 of them, 23,000 of them, 70,000 of them. And these things, he says, have happened as examples unto us. Think about what he's saying here. Many of these sort of hermeneutics of humility guys are saying, we at this point in time and place in history can't understand what Paul is saying because it's a different cultural situation and all of the different linguistic issues and all the things we've talked about here. But note this, in Paul's situation in 1 Corinthians, he's looking at the Corinthians pointing back to a very long distance prior to them, almost similar to what we're facing 
now if you take like the the time gap in between and he assumes that they can know those things as the basis of his argument so if paul can do it from that date to him why can't we because notice this paul is saying from his vantage point you can know old testament texts and know them clearly enough to justify the theology and the theological point that he's making so why can't we this is the point MacArthur's getting at from our point go to the text of scripture in the same way Paul went to the text of scripture from a historical distance with different cultural issues even different religious understandings that may come about with them to make our theological points because you can know the text Paul's argument from example can be applied as a counterexample to the hermeneutics of humility that's so readily apparent and used today you can understand that. That's not difficult to understand. Look, it is not arrogant to say you know what the Bible means. It is not arrogant. It is to be expected to know what the Bible means. Does that mean we can understand absolutely every nuance, every tiny detail, every interpretation of, of every obscure aspect of Scripture? No. No, even Peter said there were things about Paul that are hard to understand. Remember that? Peter said, there's some things Paul wrote that are really hard to understand, and I will agree with you. There are some things hard to understand. Note one of the key things, because these people are going to go, see, John MacArthur says it right there. Well, notice this. The biggest difference is this. MacArthur says there are difficult texts to understand and you can't have exhaustive knowledge. These other people are trying to say, well, you can't have exhaustive knowledge and the possibility of knowing any text is impossible because of the hermeneutics of humility. John MacArthur is in a fundamental and categorically different place than they are. One is saying you can have an objective, clear understanding of the text, even though there are some difficulties that are out there. These other people are saying you cannot have a fundamental, objective, clear, certain understanding of the text. And it doesn't matter which one you're pointing out, whether it seems like the clear main passages and the obscure things. That's the essential difference between the two. But we know what those things are that are hard to understand, and I'm not talking about the things that, that, that are impossible to understand. That's another category, like the Trinity. You have no, to... what he's trying to say here is, is fully understand the Trinity. You can understand the creedal understandings of it or the basic explanations of it in the big picture with the New Testament, but you can't fully exhaust one's understanding of the Trinity. So stop at some point and leave it alone because it's you're not going to help yourself if you just keep chasing that inconceivable reality but but it is true that there are some things that that are hard for us to fully understand but please do not connect conviction about a true interpretation of scripture with arrogance and do not connect uncertainty with humility that is ridiculous. It's also skepticism and agnosticism. We need humility where we need humility, but we don't need some kind of false humility that says, I'm so humble, I, I, don't, I would never say what's true about the Bible. That's not humility, that's just stupidity. It was uh, G.K. Chesterton, the, uh, the uh, 20th century British writer, who said, what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, that's not where you want your humility. Modesty has settled upon the organ of conviction where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself but undoubting about the truth, and this has been reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, the divine revelation. And he goes on to say, we're on the road to producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. Oh, really? You would say that would never happen? Remember, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Math is racist. You can't know it. Sounds like woke hermeneutics. This is postmodernism. 
Actually, to deny the clarity and certainty of Scripture is not humility. It is arrogance of the worst kind. It is a kind of blasphemy that accuses God of having the inability to communicate what He wanted to say in a way that could be understood. Look, God holds people accountable with regard to their eternal destiny for their understanding of His revelation, both in nature and in Scripture. Is God unfair? Is this so uh, obscure and ambiguous a revelation that God is unfair in holding men accountable for understanding it and rejecting it? I don't think so. And we would agree with John MacArthur. And you may say, well, we may not agree. Well, I agree with John MacArthur. And what I want us to do is I want us to finish here with just a couple comments. First of all, I want us to see this true reality. If God is all powerful, then he can create you to have knowledge. And if God speaks, then he can create you to understand what he says. So the point that we need to see here is, is that he is there. He is not silent. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. And God can bridge the gap from his mind to your mind through the text of scripture. And you can know what the Bible says. In other words, we finish with that famous line that he was getting at here in the whole blog post here of this whole hermeneutics of humility. And he says this again, we so often hear about the new hermeneutic grossly mislabeled as the hermeneutics of humility, which essentially says, I'm far too humble to say, I know what the Bible means. And anybody who claims to know what it means is arrogant. But what's more arrogant than claiming that God has not spoken clearly enough for us to understand you can speak clearly enough for them to understand all of your postmodern hermeneutics and existential hermeneutics and hermeneutics of suspicion, but the God of creation cannot speak clearly enough and doesn't have the ability to communicate to anybody else. You do, but they don't. And yet we're the ones that are being labeled as arrogant, please. So with that said, I'll put links down to all of the articles below, including the sermon that I spliced that from, from John MacArthur, and you can watch it in full. So again, thank you, and I appreciate it. A man has to decide that he's going to do something.